Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, whatever it is. I hope it's good for you. Uh, let's see here. By the way, that picture is uh, about 10 years, 10 years ago. Uh, there's a little more gray and a little more fat, but we're going to keep that picture. Recipient witness, expert witness testimony, we're going to go all um, over all of that. Now, testifying is a very tough thing. I've been through the, uh, under the hot seat myself, both as a recipient witness and as an expert witness, um, the, both of which we'll define later on. Well, actually, right there, recipient witness, and just the witness, the person who actually was the eyewitness and who saw everything, the one who actually sees, hears, or has admissible personal knowledge of the evidence about which he or she is to testify. This is as opposed to an expert witness. So they saw it, they heard it, they know something about it, but not in a professional um, uh, or expert way. The expert witness, on the other hand, is exactly that. They have special knowledge or skill, gained through education, training, experience, et cetera, et cetera. And they're summoned to the deposition or the trial give this evidence, to give this testimony based on their experience and expertise as opposed to their eyewitness experience. Precipitant witness and expert in the same hearing, absolutely positively possible. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in the manner of, that it impacts what you need to pay um, a doctor whom you are having to pose. Evidence code 800, a witness who, if a witness is not testifying as an expert, um, they can provide some opinion, but only to the extent that that is based on an A, rationally based on the perception, they actually saw, heard, um, witness, et cetera, and is helpful to clear up the testimony, their particular testimony. So, depot time. We're going to go over some of the basics for those of you who may be um, relatively new and aren't familiar with the deposition process, but then we will get into um, slightly more um, complicated, complicated rules. So what is a deposition? It's a recorded statement. Under oath, which is important for purposes of fraud, we'll talk about that later. Um, Semi-formal setting with counsel, which is always strongly recommended. You don't want to um, have your deposition taken without somebody there who knows the rules of evidence. And it can be videotaped. Even in workers' compensation, although some office attorneys will tell you that that's forbidden, it absolutely positively is not, and there is case law to that effect. So what are the advantages of the deposition as opposed to um, some other method of getting um, evidence? It's, it's relatively inexpensive, and you're able to narrow the issues down um, with regards to the applicant and or the doctor and or the employer witness or whomever um, we seek to depose. And it's quite informal. Disadvantages, and there are a number. You can't rely on um, intonation. You can't rely on um, the, the sound of the voice, which oftentimes uh, um, provides more information than the words utilized. Facial expressions can be very important. And if the, uh, um, the, the person who's taking the deposition is sharp, they will identify when the uh, uh, opponent is making very facial, various facial expressions and will record that um, in the deposition. Hand signals obviously cannot be seen. Um, once again, the person who's taking the deposition will need to uh, uh, describe that for the deposition transcript. And the uh -huhs, uh uhs, which I have literally, I believe, never had a deponent not fall into the uh uhs and the uh uhs, but they're very difficult to. Um, ascertain which is which, which is the positive, which is the negative, when we look to the transcript. And of course, there's the immediate resolution of squabbles. Um, occasionally, um, the uh, deponent's attorney will say, I'm not letting you ask that question. Absolutely, it's forbidden, it's covered by the attorney-client privilege, um, it's um, intimidating, et cetera, et cetera. And if we're testi or doing testimony in front of him at trial, we have a judge who's going to immediately rule on that. Um, in the deposition, that's not the case. We have to certify the question, file a DR, get in front of a judge, and get a ruling on that, and possibly go back uh, to continue to a part two deposition, which starts to get the expenses um, on up there. So, as I said, indicated earlier, um, the deponent is under oath, and the court reporter says, please tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. 
um, which reminds me of the old joke, what did the, uh, what did the uh, judge say to the dentist? She promised to tell the you promise to pull the tooth, the whole tooth, and nothing but the tooth. It's lame, but uh, at least it's a clean one you can tell the kid. Um, and perjury applies. It's very important here. Let's look at the perjury requirement. Um, California Penal Code 118 says that after taking an oath, if you lie, you're guilty of perjury. Uh, it's much easier to demonstrate perjury through a deposition transcript than it often is to um, demonstrate insurance fraud. So although we, um, when we're, we've got an applicant who's a lying son of a gun, we try to get perjury, get them for perjury and insurance fraud, um, oftentimes the DA picks up the, um, the, the perjury claim because it's right there in the transcript. Deposition time, perjury penalties, um, prison, probation, fines, community service. Unfortunately, we rarely see any of that usually we get some level of restitution in a successful perjury, um, uh, a perjury uh, uh, case. Court reporter, they only type down the words. They do not type down, as we suggested earlier, the grunts, the gestures, the pointing, the nodding. Um, that's for the attorney who's taking the deposition to make sure uh, we place verbally on the record. Uh, if you ever had to take your, have your deposition taken, to um, such phrases as to the best of my recollection, to tell you the truth. Should you use these phrases? Any thoughts? Absolutely not. Why? Well, to the best of my recollection, suggest that previously you weren't at answering questions to the best of your recollection. To tell you the truth, suggest that, well, this is a special case. I'm finally telling the truth. I've apparently lied or been uh, untruthful in the prior prior testimony. Definitely want to avoid these type of these type of phrases. Now, if you are subpoenaed. Uh, to court or to a deposition, take only what the subpoena requires and uh, go over that with your attorney. Because if you don't, if you bring additional materials, that can cause trouble. Um, if you if the uh, if the subpoena requires files and documents, materials, fine, bring that, but only take what's specified. If you're reading from or reviewing something um, at your deposition that wasn't required by the subpoena, you may be required to hand it over. In fact, you may be waiving privileges. So again, speak with your attorney, go over the sum and subpoena, and um, ascertain what exactly you can bring, and just assume you should be bringing absolutely nothing else. Again, if your deposition is taken and, and you're released, um, or you're testifying at trial, and the judge says you may step down, what does that mean? It means get out. Um, don't sit there, don't talk with anybody else, don't converse with the judge, don't converse with the attorney who's been cross-examining you, and don't converse with your um, attorney anywhere near uh, the parties uh, to the case. Simply ask if I excuse and get out of Dodge immediately. Now, we're going to try to lighten up this presentation with a few little um, transcript uh, transcripts. Lawyer. Did you really tell the police officer that after the accident you never felt better in your life? Yes, that's what I said. I want you to explain that, please. Witness. Well, you see, I was knocked unconscious in the accident, and when I came to, I saw this officer examining my horse, and then he took out his gun and shot him in the head. And then he examined my dog and shot him in the head. Then he came to me, came to me and asked, how do you feel? <laughs> All right, doctor depositions. How do you do it? This is one of the most important uh, discovery uh, um, methodologies in workers' compensation, and I think way too often we do it wrong. So let's go over some suggestions. But first, one more joke. Doctor, before you performed the autopsy, did you check for a pulse? No. Did you check for the blood pressure? No. Did you check for breathing? No. So then it's possible the patient was alive when you began the autopsy. No. Well, how can you be so sure, doctor? Because his brain was sitting on my desk in a jar. But he could have been alive nevertheless, couldn't he? Well, it's possible he could have been alive and practicing law somewhere. I think we know, all know um, a doctor that was familiar from our doctor and an attorney who might fall in that category. All right. 
take it in doctor's deposition. There's a number of things that we need to consider. First, we have to have a clear agenda. What is the reason that we want to take this deposition in the first place? Is it because your client simply said, do something? Probably not the best uh, reason for a deposition. Two, to get clarification from a complicated report that um, is unclear in some ways. Find out what the doctor knows or thinks. Put, pin down one version of the truth, because sometimes the truth can change. Catch the doctor's inconsistencies and impugn their credibility. Oftentimes, it's very important if you want to render the poor um, non-substantial or insubstantial evidence and get it knocked out. And to be honest, make the doctor look dumb. Now, that sounds hard, but it's or hard-hearted, but it absolutely is not. If you don't like the doctor's report and you can't get the doctor to change his aunt, change his, uh, his or her deck, um, um, statements. Um, the, the next step is to, again, render the report in, in, inadmissible by demonstrating it's not substantial evidence, but demonstrating the doctor doesn't know what he or she is doing. Number two, know the AMA guides at least as well as the position you're deposing. It's absolutely essential that we've gone through the entire AMA guides. We know where the doctor is hiding behind rules and we'll, the rules of the book um, that will undercut the doctor's findings. Um, uh, shameless plug here, our rating department does exactly that. We have experts that review, perform reviews, and this is an example of a review of a doctor's medical report with the analysis that, the, um, um, uh, in this particular case, identified a 40, 40 plus thousand dollar um, savings, as you can see in the middle there. Um, this is a very, very sophisticated um, very uh, detailed and can prove to be uh, very helpful. So, how do you prepare to take the doctor deposition? First, subpoena the entire file, the doctor's entire file. I've, I always, always do this. Um, I have had uh, files uh, assigned to me asking me to take the doctor's deposition with the date scheduled for the deposition, and my response has always been, we're going to reschedule the doctor's deposition until we're able to subpoena his entire file. Why would that be? Well, first off, I take hours and hours and hours, well, at least several hours, preparing for the doctor's deposition. And I review every single medical report, including the doctor's report. I can't tell you how often uh, you get to the doctor's deposition and he or she advises that they have two or three or four additional reports. And then, of course, you're scampering, trying to figure out um, what those reports say, uh, to what extent do they agree or disagree with the prior reports, et cetera, et cetera. It is basically mission impossible. You also want to make sure that you have every pain chart. Um, is the applicant, is, for, for example, and these are pain charts are the things that are the little uh, um, uh, profiles or little pictures of um, the body where the applicant demonstrates or right, right then to show where the pain is. Um, oftentimes in these pain charts, the applicant will claim that the entire leg or the entire arm hurts or burns or what have you. And now that just doesn't follow a dermatonal pattern. If you've, um, for example, injured one um, nerve root um, and uh, uh, it's going to impact the arm or the leg, but it's not going to impact the entire thing. So claims of entire legs or entire arms hurting definitely undercuts the credibility of the applicant, and to the extent that the doctor relied on this report from the injured worker, undercuts the, it un, it undercuts the validity of the doctor's report. Another reason to subpoena the doctor's entire file before going through to the doctor's deposition is get a list of every ADL um, involved. That's at table 1-2 from the AMA guide. Another reason to do so, um, the Epworth test. We have less now, um, but the, the, when we first started using the AMA guides back in 2005, it seemed that every injured worker um, had a sleep, in, uh, sleep problem, and the AMA guides relies on the Epworth sleepiness scale. Um, I had a deposition of a doctor recently in which he relied on the Epworth sleepiness table, scale and advised that the applicant had a very significant uh, sleeping problem. Well, it also subpoenaed the doctor's entire file. And you could see in it the applicant's answers, and then what appeared to be the doctor's handwriting, where he scratched out 
some of the answers and put new answers in. Asked the doctor about that, confirmed that it was his handwriting, and he said, well, what had happened was um, after the applicant performed the test, he, the doctor, uh, explained the questions to the plaintiff, to the applicant, and based upon the doctor's explanation of the question, the applicant changed her answers. Well, that's been completely forbidden um, by the Epworth sleepiness scale. So that immediately rendered the Epworth test and the uh, claim of sleep problems um, mute, mute, moot, I guess is the word. Why else do we subpoena the entire file? Well, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We simply don't know what's going to be in there. That's my pat answer. We have no idea what's going to be in there. The only way to find out is to subpoena that actor's file. I've got a little uh, story to tell you um, about finding uh, documents uh, in a doctor's file that uh, surprised everybody. A while back, I took a doctor's deposition um, and uh, asked him, to explain certain records that we had find, found in his file. Because the records demonstrated that the doctor was treating the applicant, that's fair. The records demonstrated that the doctor was billing my client, that's fair. The records, however, also demonstrated that the doctor was turning around and charging the federal government for, those, uh, for that payment. That's not fair, that's considered, to use legal terms, very naughty. Um, actually, I had the doctor um, on the record reviewing the records, and he turned to me and asked me the questions. And even though I'm supposed to be the one that's asking the questions, he turned to me and said, where did you get these records? Uh, to which I said they were in your file. He said, and I quote, those weren't supposed to be in there. Uh, I believe they weren't supposed to be in there. And the doctor had a really bad day, week, month, and year after that um, little uh, uh, discussion. All right, step two to preparing for a doctor's deposition is to determine your objectives. What do you hope to achieve? Do you want a clarification? Do you undermine the doctor's uh, credibility? What do you want to do? Um, if, one of, if, if clarification of the doctor's report is the only objective, why not just ask for a supplemental? Uh, why uh, entertain the cost um, of, in terms of time and money of obtaining the doctor's deposition in that situation. Now, do I have to try to obtain clarification in a doctor's deposition? Absolutely, I spent the first 10, 15, 20 minutes on clarification of things, but if the clarification doesn't go the way I want it, then we proceed to try to impugn the doctor's credibility, um, which is right there. Now, I've got, you were to examine every inconsistency, every illogical step, every refusal to follow the rule in terms of the AMA guides, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, every time we succeed in one of these objectives, we increase the chances that the judge will refuse to rely on that doctor's report. And the Zumke case demonstrates that. Medical reports predicated upon an incorrect legal theory and an incorrect medical theory um, do not constitute substantial evidence. And if it doesn't constitute substantial evidence, the judge simply cannot rely on it. We also want to compare reports, charts, and lists. Are the doctor's claims uh, internally, uh, internally consistent or inconsistent? Are the doctor's reports consistent with the complaints that the applicant has provided? Not only um, in the uh, notes of the, upon the subpoena file, but also compared to the applicant's deposition testimony. And we want to compare, well, that's exactly right, compare the applicant's deposition physician testimony with the uh, symptoms described in the doctor's report. It's um, oftentimes absolutely amazing how much the de de deposition testimony disagrees with the doctor's report and vice versa. So um, in workers' compensation in California, we tend to be very collegial. We want to agree um, with the opposing counsel, and uh, I think we often do so to a fault. Most doctor depositions start with the one side or the other saying, can we stipulate to the doctor's expertise? And we certainly don't want to insult the doctor, but the answer I think should, and the answer for years has been, of course we can, the doctor's a great person. But I think the answer now is no. Remember, our objective is to oftentimes undercut the doctor's, uh, or impugn the doctor's credibility, undercut the doctor's report, demonstrate that it is inconsistent, et cetera, et cetera. 
Well, if you're going to be attacking the report, attacking the doctor's um, production of the report, why in the world would you stipulate that the doctor rocks and rolls and as an, an expert? Simply don't want to do that. You're sort of undercutting or shooting yourself in the foot. Um, before the deposition has even been has even begun, um, the doctor wants to Elmarez Guzman you. I think you've all been through that. I know we've all been through that probably many many times. Um, again, we want to challenge the doctor's expertise in terms of El Elmarez Guzman. Uh, remember, the evidence code provides that a person is qualified to testify as an expert if they have special knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education sufficient to qualify them as an expert. So we want to ask the doctor about their background, about their information, about their expertise rather, about their education in terms of the AMA guides and Elmer and Guzman. What is the extent of the doctor's training? What is in terms of the AMA guide, in terms of Elmer and Guzman? How many medical legal reports has he or she written? How many times have those reports involved Elmer and Guzman? And let's say the doctor does insist that they still want to Elmoraz Guzman you, and that is not a fun thing. You want to ask, why didn't the doctor use the traditional parts of the AMA guide? Let's take a look at this. The Sixth District Court of Appeal back a while ago in the Guzman case told us that given the comprehensiveness of precision attendant in the chapters pertaining to the each body system, and by the way, the chapters that, re that refers to the AMA guides, in most cases, a judge will credit ratings based on a strict application of the AMA guide. In most cases. So if the doctor, in most cases, utilizes the AMA guide, that runs completely counter to Guzman, and the doctor has some explaining to do. What's the dep best deposition um, that ever? One that is canceled. And uh, I often find that we can set the doctor's deposition and get the results that we want before the deposition proceeds. Do, do doctors like having their deposition taken? Um, I know sometimes we think so because the doctors are much like me and like to talk or hear themselves talk. Um, but there are a number of downsides sides to having your deposition taken. One, the thing is early in the morning or later in the evening, and the doctor has to spend more time away from home. Two, although they're getting $250 an hour, which sounds like a lot of money to me, um, that's a money-losing proposition uh, for the doctor um, invariably. Three, um, the doctor gets to sit there and be attacked, have their credibility impugned, try to play uh, gotcha by somebody like me. So having your deposition taken, um, if you're a doctor or anybody, any other kind of opponent, really isn't all that much fun. If you've had your deposition taken previously, I think you know what I mean. So you want the chances of getting the getting what you want without a deposition? Well, first off, avoid the Elmoraz Guzman baloney by putting the doctor on notice that you know what you're talking about. I've got a letter here um, to the doctor that I drafted quite a while ago outlining some of the problems with Elmoraz Guzman attempts and providing questions that you should address to the doctor to make their utilization of the Elmarez Guzman that much more difficult. I think this letter, which is found on slides 52 through, through 54, I believe, no, maybe even 55, um, please feel free to cut and paste this thing into your letters to the doctor. Um, I think it does a few things. Again, it says to the doctor, if you want Elmer as Guzman, we are going to be asking you a lot of questions. Um, also, doctor, um, by as is demonstrated by this letter, we know Elmer as Guzman in inside, inside and out. Do you, doctor, feel as um, comfortable with the AMA guide as me? All right. Medical miracles, how to cut off temporary disability. Oftentimes, California workers' compensation uh, results in um, what may be viewed as a medical miracle. And that's um, particularly the case with temporary disability. Um, I, pra I practice California workers' comp in northern and southern California and been to virtually every WCAB district office. And I found that 
this miracle approach works probably 75 to 85% of the time. You've all been there. So the PTP's report uh, describes the condition and says CTD. The next month, the doctor issues a report that is exactly like the prior report and says CTD. The next month, the doctor does exactly the same thing, and the following month, the same thing. Now, that, by definition, is the uh, is MMI, or PNS. If there have been no changes, and it apparently doesn't look like there are going to be any changes, um, the, the applicant is, is, has been stationary. They're, they've re reached maximum medical, um, um, medical ma maximum medical, um, um, uh, a maximum medical state. So what I will do in this situation is send a letter to the doctor, provide the definition of PNS and MMI, which by the way, per regulation are synonymous, provide the definition of these two terms, outline the fact that the doctor has demonstrated through the last many reports that the applicant is stationary, and then ask the doctor to, based upon that information, declare applicant MMI. And invariably, the next report does exactly what the prior ones were, finding applicant CTTD. So the following month, we send a similar letter to the doctor, staple the prior letter to the doctor, and at the very same time, notice the doctor's deposition. Like I say, 75 to 85% of the time throughout California, a medical miracle occurs, and I suspect maybe to avoid deposition, the doctor finds applicant stationary. It's just miraculous. See how it works for you. Ah, depositions of physicians. Why don't we take the doctors, just uh, cross-examine the doctor in front of the judge at trial? Well, similar to voc rehab counselors based, up, uh, based upon the recent uh, uh, statutory change of SBA 63, the WCAB, per regulation, favors the production of medical evidence in the form of written reports. Direct exam of medical witnesses will not be received at trial except on a showing of good cause. I probably had less than a half a dozen cases in which good cause was even offered, let alone um, declared to be good cause. We favor cross-examination by deposition. What about utilization review doctors? What about deposing them? Absolutely not. Reason? One, there's no legal basis for a supplemental report from the UR doctor, and that includes deposition. Two, the appeal process is to go to IMR, not to challenge the utilization review doctor's uh, findings directly. <laughs> now, I suspect we'll find some disagreement on this point from our friends at the California Applicants Attorneys Association, but if you are doing so, please fight for them, Aguilar, and uh, there's always the threat of sanctions, too, for wasting our time and money. Doctor's deposition fee. Well, is it an expert opinion, or are they a witness? Um, Labor Code Section 4621 provides for payment of deposition fees similar to that of a medical legal expense. But so the you know, 250 bucks or whatever the current rate is, is the rate that we're going to pay the doctor for deposition. A percipient witness, on the other hand, the person who just saw something or heard something or felt something, um, they are not an expert, so they don't get an expert opinion fee. So if the doctor just witnessed the accident, and that's all we ask about, that the doctor, what the doctor saw or perceived when watching the accident, um, or, for example, we just proposed the doctor about the medical history that the applicant provided, well, at that point, they're just a percipient witness. They're not an expert, and therefore, they get no expert fee, only the standard daily fee that you and I would give if we were testifying in most likely, in, in um, all likelihood, as a percipient witness. Now, the WCAB really doesn't like underpaying doctors and having them not get their standard expert fee, but instead getting a daily fee. And it has been ruled that even if you ask, 99.9% .9 of your deposition is percipient witness type, type of um, questions, even if one medical opinion is buried there in the transcript, 
this will qualify the expert, the doctor, as an expert, and they get the, an expert fee for the entire deposition. So if you're trying to ask the doctor questions that only involve precipient witness kind of things, make sure that nothing about medical opinion is ever asked. All right, when do we pay the doctor? The CCRs tell us that we pay in advance of the deposition, and we pay the estimated amount. Um, but this is only to doctors appointed or quote unquote agreed to by the parties. Prepayment is not required, for example, of the applicant's, uh, applicant's deposition of the defense QME. At least this is relevant back when we had dueling QMEs, and I suspect we may very well have a dueling QME system um, in the not too distant future. And this RODAS, uh, RODAS cases case will uh, apply then as well. So prepayment, the best idea is to pay the doctor up front when they receive the subpoena. And the date of the oral deposition is actually required by the CCPC. Uh, I strike that. The day, um, 10 days, at least 10 days after, um, after the service of the deposition notice. So why not just issue it at the same time? Prepayment, how much do we prepay? Well, we uh, traditionally, and I think every judge in the state will be comfortable with, one hour of prep time, one hour testimony for a total of two hours. But I strongly recommend that the person taking the deposition bring a checkbook because often the doctors want to end the deposition as soon as possible and will stay at the two hour point. Listen, uh, boys and girls, that's all you paid me for, so I don't have to have my deposition taken. If we have our checkbook, they can offer that up to the uh, doctor at that time. That kind of stymies uh, their um, attempt to get out of further deposition testimony. All right, speak, and we're, we're, we're kind of done with the expert deposition testimony. Let's go to the deposition of the applicant. How much are our friends at the California Applicants Attorneys Association really worth? And by the way, before we proceed in this, I want to say that I did an article very similar to this. Um, and it is posted on the Bradford and Barthel website. And I've received a number of comments from applicants attorneys who said, Don, we disagree with you. Well, I certainly hope they do. Um, it's not my job to be uh, agreeable on this score. So AA says, show me the money. It, back in the old days, before SB 899, before SB 863, um, applicants' attorneys were doing all right. Remember, permanent disability used to be based on subjectives and work restrictions. Cha-ching. Uh, penalties. Remember the 10% of the entire species? Cha-ching. Um, remember those uh, fees for simple vocational rehabilitation work? Cha-ching. Our friends at COG were doing pretty well financially, as far as I can tell. But things have changed significantly. And our friends at COG are always claiming... Uh, claiming that they're going broke. So how do they make up the difference? Well, one of the approaches is Labor Code Section 5710 fee. By the way, 5710 of the Labor Code is the provision that provides for um, applicants attorney's fees when we take the applicant's deposition, or for that matter, um, a, uh, um, if we have a uh, dead uh, applicant um, of the spouse of the children of the any beneficiary. So how much should you pay applicants or counsel for the deposition? The law provides, oh, there's 5710, that we provide a reasonable attorney fee if the applicant has an attorney at the deposition. What's reasonable? Well, um, show me a couple of attorneys, and I'll show you a, a debate of what, what reasonable means. That word is a full, um, the Full Employment Act for attorneys. We can never agree amongst ourselves what reasonable means. Uh, what's reasonable in your mind, I'm sure, would disagree or uh, be contrary to that uh, with one of our friends at CAW. And let's see here. Well, be careful. I don't know if you've seen these before, but floating around at virtually every WCAB district office is something they call the attorney fee guidelines and recommendations. They're created by local applicants' attorneys who have one thing in mind, making more money, 
local defense attorneys who don't represent you, and why would you want to rely on a defense by somebody who's not representing you? And the workers' comp judges, usually a PJ, um, who's basing it on generalities and not the particulars of your um, particular case. So the attorney fee guideline is a good starting point. It, it tells us what the uh, local community generally thinks, but it's just a starting point. Uh, it's not the ending point. Um, traditionally, judges will allow the amount found in the guidelines if that's the amount that the applicant's attorney requests, and if we don't object or we stipulate to that amount. That doesn't necessarily be, that's not necessarily the case. Which boards is this involved? Like I said, most of them that I've seen attorney fee guidelines from Sacramento, San Francisco, San Diego, Salinas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. By the way, if you need a copy of your local attorney fee guideline um, and you try to Google it, I was very surprised when I attempted to Google this. I could find only one uh, district office represented on the entire uh, www, so uh, the World Wide Web. Um, so what you'll need to do is go to the WCAB district or uh, office or have one of your attorneys down there and photocopy and get a get a photocopy to you. So Salinas, to give you some idea as to the uh, rates um, that are generally considered reasonable, as of 2010, Salinas said 3,000 bucks for anybody who has up to five years um, work cop experience, 350 for five to nine years, and 400 for folks that are that had at least 10 years of workers comp or are certified specialists. And this is the breakdown that you'll normally find in any of the guidelines throughout California. Uh, I love this. Fresh out of law school, 300 bucks an hour. I wish I made 300 dollars an hour. I'm sure you agree with it. There's our fresh, uh, freshly minted attorney right there. They're getting younger and younger, aren't they? What about a specialist? We mentioned a specialist here, 400 bucks. If they got 10 years of experience or a certified specialist, what is a specialist, pray tell? They have to have at least five years in which they're substantially um, um, involved in workers' compensation. They need to have taken at least 100 depositions or involved themselves in pretrial conferences or petitions for removal, at least 20 trials and five recons or answers to recons or petitions to the district court of appeal or answers there too. And at least 10 Dr. Cross X. So there's a lot of background and experience for specialists and I don't for a second think that they don't deserve uh, a greater amount of deposition fee than um, your, your normal <laughs> standard issue um, applicant's attorney. How much experience does the applicant's attorney have? Ask him or her. I mean, we should do that at the deposition, and we don't have to rely on that entirely. If we just go to the California Bar Association um, website, you can uh, look up the attorney and find out all this in in interesting information about them. This guy, Donald Ralph Barthel, looks kind of sleazy. So what kind of evidence, this attorney fee guidelines, the thing that I suggested is just the starting line. What kind of evidence is this, quote, unquote? Well, that's a trick question. The truth of the matter is, it's not evidence. This is from a case uh, called the Haller case, and Judge Stack said exhi the exhibits, that is the attorney fee the guidelines, are not only inappropriate under the labor code, but they're irrelevant, irrelevant, immaterial, and inadmissible hearsay. They're just folks' opinion. It's like, so I like that verbiage. Irrelevant, immaterial, inadmissible hearsay. Um, when I'm fighting attorneys, uh, 57, 10 fees that I find completely unreasonable, uh, these are some of the words and phrases that uh, I uh, toss up at the workers' compensation judge who's hearing the case. Your opinions as well. Great defense language. So where does the Haller case leave us? Number one, don't believe the, the guidelines, but don't entirely ignore them. And there are other considerations. Can take a look at the Harvey case. Um, Dr. Uh, Commissioner Kaplan said it was appropriate to consider the attorney's efforts. They also consider the attorney's time, care, experience, skill, results, complexity of the case, um, et cetera. Effort and care, 
did applicant's attorney properly object to questions? Or was he or she reviewing files? Or was he or she reading newspapers or these days email? Or did he or she fall asleep? My very first deposition nearly 25 years ago in workers' compensation um, had the applicants, found applicant's attorney who fell asleep. It was quite a, um, an introduction to workers' compensation. By the way, how did I handle that? I whispered during the rest of the deposition. Skill and results, uh, the commissioner said. Read the transcript for insight. Complexity of the issues. Is this your standard back case, back strain, which you know, makes up what, like what, 99% of our cases? Or is it a convoluted, complicated and convoluted case? This should too be factored in to determine the 5710 fee. It really does make a difference. Once we have finally set up on a reasonable rate, we need another multiplier. The amount of time that um, was involved in the deposition. Start stop time. You should get that in the deposition transcript, and you should be getting that in the in the hearing report from um, your your attorney. Reviewing the file, many many applicants' attorneys will charge for reviewing the file. Absolutely not. We don't pay for that, and I don't think there's any judge, at least any reasonable judge, who is going to order that you do so. Client prep time. Well, you want to ask the applicant under oath. How much time did your attorney meet with you? 30 minutes? Fine. 60 minutes? Uh, maybe okay if the applicant confirms this and it's a complicated, sophisticated case. Any longer, an applicant's attorney has some explaining to do. Travel time. Travel time is allowed. We're, and how much is the travel? How much uh, is allowed? A reasonable amount. So let's say the applicant's attorney is based in Stockton and the defense sets the deposition in Sacramento, um, and I'm not sure why they would do it. It would probably be cheaper to set it in Stockton, but they set it in Sacramento, and that's an hour trip. Is that reasonable to, to uh, um, pay applicant's attorney for that? Sure. But what if you've got an applicant's attorney that's based in Los Angeles and the injured worker is in San Francisco? Well, is that reasonable for us to pay for applicants' attorney to fly up to San Francisco or drive the six hours to get up to San Francisco? Absolutely not. Why is it this attorney who's handling the case? Are, they, are there no qualified attorneys closer to San Francisco? I, I don't think the judge is going to find that. This is exactly the question that the doctor is going to the judge. The judge is going to issue, and um, we should not pay for that. Review the 5710 fee order. When we get that, timely object, if appropriate. When? Well, read the order. That will tell us how many days, usually about 20 days, plus five for mailing, to issue a timely objection. So what do we want to consider um, when we're dealing with 5710 fees again? Just to review, the attorney fee guidelines is a starting point. Does applicant's counsel meet the requirements therein? Are they billing at a higher, lower, lower, or the same rate as the guidelines? What are applicants' attorneys' qualifications? Been in the business forever or a newbie? Are they a specialist? What is the effort and care demonstrated by the deposition? What are the skill and results demonstrated? What are the complex? What is the complexity of the issues? Oftentimes, applicants' attorneys will ask at the beginning of the deposition, "Can we stipulate to the rate of?" to the rate of um, the 5710 fee? Absolutely not. Why would we stipulate to that other than wanting to be friendly? Well, <laughs> I don't know. And we don't know what's going to ha happen at the deposition. We don't know if the applicant attorney is going to show care and effort. We don't know what the results and skill are going to be that are going to be demonstrated. We probably know the complexity of the issues, but we don't know where the applicant attorney is going to fall asleep or read emails or actually listen to the case and um, object properly to questions that are objectionable. Um, there have been times when applicants or attorneys have said, okay, you're not going to stipulate to the rate of 5710 feet here before we start the deposition. I'm not going to let the deposition proceed. This is not a position taken by sophisticated old, old timers. This is usually a young applicant's attorney procedure and it's entirely inappropriate 
and sanctions are appropriate as well. And that is something that should be discussed when an applicant's attorney takes such a position. Is it worth the fight in terms of debating and arguing about the 710C? In other words, how much fat is too much? How much, I'm sorry about the picture, kind of disgusting. No, it's not my picture. Um, how much over a charge is worth fighting? Time to do a little bit of math on the score. It's worth the fight, consider this, the amount of the overcharge. How much are we actually fighting about? The cost of the objection. How much is it gonna take us to file an objection, which is really someone cheap, and go down to the hearing? What is our relationship with applicants, not counsel? Um, is this an old timer with whom we deal with, um, with whom we deal on, on a constant basis? We might not want to, um, we might not to want to spoil the environment with him or her. Other thoughts, it's a bar it can be used as a bargaining chip. I'm sure all of you have seen um, the drafting of a CNR, which as part of the consideration involves the payment of the remainder of applicant's attorney's 57 cent fee. That's highly suspect because it appears that the applicant counsel and the applicant have a conflict of interest. Um, it doesn't only appear to be the case, that is the case. Nevertheless, we see that all the time in California workers' compensation, and um, uh, we want to consider um, that, we'll provide that in, uh, as, or evaluate that um, in our consideration as to whether we're going to engage in the 5710 fee fight. Well, we mentioned 50, 5710, let's get another labor code. When denying a writ of review filed by the defendant and the DCA finds it's frivolous or without merit, applicant's counsel again gets a reasonable fee for the answer. Um, why is that relevant? Well, I think um, the, this is a good guideline for 5710 fees as well. Um, uh, we have case law wherein it was um, ruled that a $300 fee for an attorney with quote, unquestioned experience, end quote, was entirely reasonable. We also have case law for a $250, funding $250 reasonable for a two-year attorney who is not a certified specialist. Um, AA can take employer witness depositions. Um, the managers, supervisors, um, employees, et cetera, et cetera. And I would think in virtually every instance, these witnesses would be percipient witnesses, not expert opinion, not, not expert opinion um, witnesses. So, applicants really can take the deposition, but this rarely happens. Can you imagine why? Well, here's a hint. It's a non-reimbursable expense for applicants counsel. In other words, it's gonna cost them money to have the deposition, and they ain't gonna get paid back. So the alternative is to start try to subpoena the defense, defense witness statements if they exist. Um, now here's a um, shameless plug. When taking the witness statements, you may want to consider hiring an attorney to do that. Um, worded correctly, um, and with the questions worded correctly, the answers worded correctly, the evaluation by the attorney of the caliber of the witness um, can be, if done right, covered by the attorney client privilege and the attorney work product privilege, and therefore making the defense witness statements um, unavailable to applicant counsel, even if they attempt to subpoena them. Um, I said earlier that occasionally applicant's attorneys will hold the uh, deposition hostage and refuse to proceed in this case until um, applicant's counsel, or rather defense counsel, provides documentation, some investigative reports, witness statements. Uh, in civil court, this is absolutely forbidden. In workers' comp, it's a gray area. Sometimes it works for applicant's counsel, sometimes it doesn't work. We've got the El Pollo Loco case. Those of you who know what El Pollo Loco means, Whoops, I'm missing a slide. Oh well. Um, the El Pollo local case, the Vallejo case, said the injured worker was entitled to a copy of her own recorded statement before her taking her deposition. The Armando case 
um, in the Amano case, the injured worker petitioned to compel production of witness statements, the recorded uh, private um, investigator observations, the claims examiner's notes, pretty much everything under the sun. The uh, defense said, we don't, have to, we don't have to release this until after applicant's deposition, which is a position I always take. And the holding was the deposition was postponed until the, doc the documents were produced. And in the cases in which the defense attorney said, no, no, these are covered by privileges, such as the attorney-client privilege, such as the attorney work um, product privilege, and or any other privileges, um, these had to be reviewed by the judge in camera. So what does that mean? It means the, the records that we think are covered by a privilege, we provide all of these for the review by the judge. Um, the judge in, or her, in his or her chambers reviews those documents and says, yep, it is covered by a privilege. You don't have to provide that to applicant's counsel. Or no, it is not covered by a privilege, and therefore you um, do not have to provide it to applicant's counsel. How about the Denton case? Applicant tried to delay the deposition until the witness statements were produced. It was held, nope, you got to give the deposition even before the witness statements are produced. The statements were to be produced 10 days after the applicant signed the deposition or there was a, a waiver. And I think this is worth reading. The WCJ has the discretion to make such orders as will balance the interest of the parties and result in substantial evidence, uh, suggest substantial justice being produced in an unencumbered, inexpensive, and expeditious manner. A hard and fast rule that witness statements should be produced when requested would be inconsistent with the practice concerning production of sub rosa only in the after the deposition, which of course is something we do. And it would take from the defendant an effective tool with which to test the applicant's recollection and credibility. So we definitely have a shot in most cases of not providing the records, of not providing the statements, et cetera, prior to the applicant's deposition. And in most cases, I would argue that we strongly, uh, we take a strong stance on that. The, um, this um, uh, statement here makes reference to sub rosa as well. Um, under no circumstances would I release sub rosa uh, to any party unless and until to the doctors, to the applicant, the applicant's counsel, until the deposition has been taken. Let's continue. The timing of production of requested witness statements is best left for the judge to determine based upon the need to encourage the parties to investigate both the good and bad aspects of their positions, the need to prevent a party from taking advantage, and the need to prevent undue prejudice, which will result in an injustice. In other words, it's a gray area. Let's take a, the, take a look at the Brum case, for example. We had a death of a police officer and was blamed on drugs, and the allegation was that this was due to work stress. The defense obtained statements from virtually everywhere, everyone, the supervisor, the captain, co-employees, even family members. And these statements were defend they're demanded by applicant counsel, and the applicant counsel would not let the deposition take, take place before these statements were re released. Um, it would uh, argue that the attorney-client privilege and attorney work privileges apply but the judge found that not to be the case. So which comes first? It was held that the deposition nevertheless would come first. Um, the ruling was that if the theory of the injury was job stress um, caused by, that, that caused the drug taking, the widow's truthfulness about um, the decedent did not depend on her review of the statement. Arguments for disclosure pre-depo failed to show any significant prejudice or reparable harm, and therefore the deposition proceeded without the release of these statements. Compare and contrast the Kramer case. The employer was required to provide the applicant own statements prior to the deposition. While providing statements of other witnesses to the opponent in advance of deposition can have the potential to confuse or unduly influence the opponent, those risks do not appear as significant when the opponent is merely reviewing his or his or her own, or her own statement. It can plausibly plausibly be argued that allowing the applicant to review in advance of the depot his statement would actually aid the party because it would refresh his or her memory. Other costs in taking the applicant's deposition. 
transportation and my meal and lodging. If it's a local case, it's just be mileage. If they're too impaired to drive, we will have to pay for transportation costs, including a, a van or what have you. Too far to drive for them? Well, planes, trains, and automobiles may be the case, and we may have, and we will have to pay for that as well. And if you have to move them from out of state, you may want to try to coordinate the deposition with the timing of the QME um, um, or AME examination. examination. Um, we are required to reimburse any loss, may, miss out on wages, but of course, most every time the applicant is TTD, and we have no worries about paying wages. We also have to provide a copy of the transcript, the attorney's fees that we've discussed, and interpreter's fees if that is a reasonable cost. Mileage, always pay the mileage up front. This case is a scary case. It said we've refused or failed to provide transportation costs. Applicant refused to take the deposition. The trial proceeded, and the judge said, tough luck defense. There's no denial of due process. You fail to pay up the money for transportation expenses, you're not going to get the deposition the deposition, the trial is going to go without that. 99 cent store, we had an unlicensed representative um, defend the deposition. Remember, 5710 says labor code. That labor code says they have to be a licensed uh, attorney. It was held no, no. They can be an unlicensed representative, a hearing rep, so long as they're adequately supervised by the attorney, the applicant's attorney in this case, and identified as a non-attorney. However, they're going to be paid less probably significantly less. Um, it's sometimes argued that we're not going to pay for the deposition of 57 centies until the applicant signs the transcript. Nope, we lose on that one. What about if there's no AOEC, so you, AOEC will be finding, the judge finds that there is no injury, um, AOEC OE, it doesn't matter. We pay the 57 centies according to this unbonked decision, Mitchell. What about fraud? Well, in that situation, we may or may not pay the attorney fee. The question is going to be, um, it, it, the holding with due process, um, we need to determine the attorney fee, well, strike that, it's a violation of due process to order the attorney fee without the opportunity to be heard if the defense is alleging fraud. So we defer the case, we wait to determine whether there is fraud, and at that point, um, provide or do not provide the 57 centies as the case may be. It is the same case as, as medical legal um, costs. Suspend proceedings and bar benefits. Um, oftentimes we attempt to do that. We can't, we can compel the applicant, the judge can compel the applicant to attend the deposition, but we cannot suspend proceedings and bar benefits for a failure to attend the deposition. Contrast that to the failure to attend a medical examination. If the judge um, compels the applicant to do so and they don't, we may in that situation suspend proceedings and bar benefits. Alternative weapons to combating the failure to attend the deposition, contempt, sanctions, and a petition to dismiss the case because if they don't want their deposition taken, apparently they're failing to proceed or prosecute their case. An employer representative at the deposition, we are almost done, by the way. Um, oftentimes, it's a good idea to have an employer representative, supervisor, at the deposition. And applicants counsel, uh, counsel hate this. They claim a privacy, they claim embarrassment, and they claim Labor Code Section 3762, um, which provides that um, the, uh, the uh, insurer, third party administrator, et cetera, may not provide any medical evidence or medical information to the employer, um, that these all apply and um, preclude the employer rep from attending after the deposition. The WCAB doesn't buy this. So if you want an employer rep there, you, in almost all cases, and there's only one exception I know of, we'll go over that very quickly, um, if you want an employer representative there, you're gonna get an employer representative there. Let's think of the Padilla case. Applicant's counsel objected to the presence of uh, the uh, applicant, applicant's manager um, saying, I don't want him to be there during the questioning regarding medical history. And it was held that the employer has the right to be present. The, if the only situation in which they're not to be present is that the applicant can demonstrate good cause for a protective order, and that's gonna require that they go in front of a judge to explain their situation. The Patilla case explanation was, number one, if you're filing a workers' compensation claim against the employer, you've waived 
your medical um, information privacy rights. Um, and the Labor Code Section 3762 that applicants attorneys often cite simply does not apply to the disclosure by the injured worker at deposition. It only applies to insurance carriers, third party administrators, um, and pre it only prohibits them providing medical information to the employer. Here's our last case, but I feel intimidated since the injured worker. I don't want my deposition taken with that, in, with that employer rep because I'm scared of them. Well, we have one case that sides, sides with the applicant in this case. In all cases, in virtually all cases, the defense that has the right to have an employer represented present, um, and in this case, the injured worker failed to identify any privacy right that potentially impacted them. Um, the applicant in this case said they felt intimidated, but that doesn't do the trick. If they feel intimid intimidated, they have applicant's counsel there. If they feel intimidated, they have legal remedies if the defense does anything inappropriate. So generally speaking, even if the applicant feels intimidated, we get an employer representative here. But he'll drive me crazier, says the applicant. Well, if that's true, maybe the employer representative can't be there. And this, uh, I can't pronounce the name, but it's called San Bernardino case. Here are the facts. There was a psych claim alleged, and it was alleged that the supervisor caused the psych, psych problems. Well, the same supervisor appeared at the deposition. You can imagine that didn't sit well with the applicant. The applicant became stressed, and it was held, in fact, there was apparently crying and ranting. It was held that the supervisor's attendance was barred because this would cause oppression. Not a big deal, but first, here we go. The applicant actually, did, um, um, uh, there was testimony and information that applicant actually had uncontrollable crying, shaking, and severe um, distress when confronted by the supervisor. And there was a medical report that said she would be, it would be extraordinarily detrimental to her psyche if the, if the employer rep was there. So what's the solution? There's, this still doesn't mean that we can't have an employer representative there. We just send a different employer representative. All right, let's finish with this. Doctor, how many autopsies have you performed on dead people? All my autopsies are performed on dead people, which is a really good idea. Do you recall the time that you examined the body? The autopsy started around 8.30. And Mr. Johnson was dead at the time? No, he was sitting on the table wondering why I was doing an autopsy. Well, that's it. We've gone a little bit over time, for which I apologize. If you have any questions, please send them on over, and I will answer them as quickly as possible. Once again, thank you so much for being here, and don't forget to sign up for our next webinar, which will be next month. In fact, we've got a plan for the next six months, and we're looking forward to having you there. Thanks so much. Have a great day.